Welcome everyone, good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual roundtable. My name is Andy Russell. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at SUNY Polytechnic Institute in Utica and Albany, New York. And I'm also a co-director of the maintainers along with Jessica Meyerson and Lee Vinsel who are joining us today. Today we're presenting Measuring Maintenance, a roundtable discussion with Stephanie Hoops and Daniel Trellia. Dan, I should have asked you how to pronounce your last name. Well, so you actually pronounced it correctly. I don't. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I pronounce it Treglia, but Treglia, Tre okay. Tre Treglia is, is more, you know, correct. All right, uh, so you can pronounce the G or not. Um, they both work with United's Way, United Way's Alice Project. Um, I'm the facil facilitator for the discussion, and Jessica Meyerson will also help facilitate this event. She'll keep an eye on questions or comments that you submit using Zoom's chat feature. Um, we thought we would start with uh, a brief comment from me about our subject. So we frequently discuss maintenance in moral terms. Um, for example, we should take better care of our things and one another, uh, but we find it's also essential for us to be able to quantify the importance of maintenance, as well as the contributions and work of the people who we refer to as maintainers. Today's discussion features a project that quantifies the cost of a basic household budget in order to understand how many households are currently asset limited, income constrained, employed, or ALICE. As we'll see, this happens to be a staggering proportion of people in the United States. Using many of the same data sources and methods, we can also better understand how compensation is distributed amongst maintenance occupations in contrast to occupations that are often considered innovative. Just a little housekeeping then before we get started. We've asked Stephanie and, and Daniel to give us a 20 minute presentation about their work. We'll follow that with 10 or 15 minutes of moderated discussion where I'll pose some questions for Stephanie and Daniel to answer. Uh, we'd like you to um, think of questions or comments in the meantime, and as you do, please type them into the chat box in Zoom. We'll save uh, 20 minutes at the end for Q&A with the audience, and we'll base that on the questions that you submit in the chat, so be ready for that. And one important request, which it looks like everyone has anticipated already, um, we'd like you to mute your uh, microphone during the presentation. And you may also wish to turn off your camera as well. Uh, before we begin, or as we begin, I'd like to ask all the participants here to please introduce yourself in the chat, um, just uh, listing your name and organizational affiliation. And while you do that, I'll ask Stephanie and Dan to introduce themselves before starting their presentation. So Stephanie and Dan, take it away. Sure. Stephanie, Great. do you want to go? I'll, yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll go first and then you can present first. Great. <laughs> uh, so my name is Stephanie Hoops and I am the director of United Way's Alice Project, uh, which we started about 10 years ago now uh, as a small pilot in northern New Jersey. And since then, uh, it has grown to a national project across the country. Uh, Dan's going to fill you in a little bit more on the background of, of the project. but. Um, the, the crux of it is we saw a lot of uh, financial hardship in our communities, and yet the federal poverty level was not capturing that. So we are kind of an innovative think tank that has developed these measures of financial hardship um, and are expanding the way that, that we're using them and um, working with stakeholders to, to have them used um, across the country. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. And my name uh, is, is Dan Treglia. I appreciate Andy going with the, with the formal Daniel, but it's usually my wife saying that when she's not in a pleasant mood with me. Um, but so you can call me Dan. And I am a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania at the School of Social Policy and Practice. Um, and uh, my work is primarily uh, homelessness work. And I'm also a, a research fellow um, on the uh, United Way Alice Project. Um, and this has given me an incredible, I've been doing this for three or four years now, and it's given me a wonderful opportunity to kind of get outside of my, my little silo, out of my little kind of homelessness health services bubble, and uh, kind of see the, the big picture and connect the small kind of extreme version of poverty and, and housing instability with some of the macro level factors uh, going on. And so with that, kind of, let's just jump right in. Um, so we, we've titled this presentation, and kind of I think it's a nice summary of our work, kind of working hard but struggling to survive. 
And as you'll see as we go through this presentation, that kind of summarizes in, in kind of too well um, the, the, the lives of many of the people that, that do a lot of work to maintain our, um, our economy. So here's a little bit about what we're gonna cover today. Uh, we'll give an introduction to Alice, how we measure financial hardship, who is Alice a little bit, um, and then we'll move kind of to a more explicit connection with the maintainer's work more generally, talking about where does Alice work, how many maintainer jobs are Alice jobs. Um, and the other thing that, that is an important piece of this is uh, what does automation look like over the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years? Not that we're in a position to project that, but we rely on uh, great work from those that, that have made some sort of predictions. Um, and then we look at how it affects um, people in a lot of the, these maintenance level jobs. Um, and we're gonna go through this relatively quickly because like any good academic, we're gonna try, try to fit 40 minutes worth of material into uh, 20 minutes worth of presentation. Um, and so hopefully we'll, there'll be time for Q&A later to, but I know there will be time uh, for Q&A later to resolve any questions that you might have. Okay. Okay, so let's start off and I think, um, and you mentioned this earlier, what does ALICE stand for? It stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained um, and Employed. Um, and generally what we're talking about here is people that are kind of making above the, or earning above the federal poverty line, um, which we'll get into in a second, but is widely known to be, you know, a bit erroneous and, and quite an understatement in terms of uh, measuring financial struggle. Um, but people that still aren't making enough to make ends meet, they can't afford uh, the basics. And so that's who we're referring to as kind of the Alice population, the Alice household. So this project began in 2007 by looking at one county in New Jersey. Um, and it was a kind of well-off county and that presented um, some misconceptions, some misunderstandings about it. Because when you see a county with a low poverty rate or um, a high median earnings, you might think, Everything is great there. There's no real need for services. Um, and as this project got underway and they really explored this county, they saw kind of a hidden population of people that were struggling to make ends meet. And from there, that grew, right? It's grown to uh, pr produce, we have, we have we produce national data, but we also produce full reports um, for 20 states. Um, and the goal is to become a standard measure of financial insecurity and insufficiency. And we want to change the common vernacular, right? At this point, poverty and poor, they have significantly negative connotations. And so we want to change kind of those, those words to reflect kind of the Alice, um, the Alice label. And so we produce current research. Um, we integrate our very specific um, research with projects like this one and some others that also look at kind of how people are, are living, uh, people's health, people's income, um, macroeconomic factors, um, and how they're, they're getting by on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so let's start with a 47 second history lesson. So the, I think it's important to note that current measures fall short. Um, they do not capture the extent of financial hardship and more, more qualitatively, the causes of financial hardship, right? The gold standard, not the gold standard, but the standard that is used um, to measure these things and develop eligibility for financial assistance programs um, is the federal poverty level developed in 1963. The initial version was developed in 63, um, kind of approved for formal use uh, later on in that decade. Uh, by an economist at the Social Security Administration named Molly Orshansky. And food being about a third of the, the average household's budget at that point, um, she generally, she took about a third, uh, she took the cost of food, multiplied that by three, and that became the federal poverty level. Um, and beyond adjusting for inflation and some other very small changes, um, that has remained the standard by which we kind of assess poverty and financial insecurity um, even since then, even though food no longer represents just a, th uh, a third of the, of the um, of household costs, um, it's actually much, much lower now. Okay, so one of the questions is, is why does this matter? Um, and I think that's intuitive, but let's talk about it for a second. Um, among other things, um, it, it, it kind of frames our understanding of what our what what the need is, um, and 
more kind of concretely, it's used to establish eligibility for public assistance. Um, it's the bar against which we measure things like uh, minimum wage. It's also how we measure success. Did we get a, a household out of poverty um, or not? Um, but the problem is that getting a household out of poverty does not actually get someone kind of to a place of the, the, most, the most bare financial um, security. And in fact, 40% of households uh, that leave poverty um, fall back into poverty within about five years. Okay. So we have a couple of graphs here that reflect the federal poverty level versus the actual cost of living. Uh, so there are several problems there are several problems with using the federal poverty level, um, among them being that they don't include uh, kind of major costs, things like um, housing and childcare and healthcare expenses, um, things like that. Um, and so that's one. And another big one is that it does not um, include a variation based on geography, except for Alaska and Hawaii um, are different than the rest of the other 48 states. Um, but it means that uh, a rural county in Indiana, Randolph County, um, has the same federal poverty level um, and therefore the same, generally the same eligibility requirements for uh, financial need um, as uh, Manhattan uh, in New York City. Um, and that's even, even true with, within, um, within a city to some degree. So I'm from Staten Island, which is a much cheaper place to live uh, than Manhattan. But again, we're basing things off of the same thresholds, so off of the same thresholds. Um, and here's the quick example on the left. We can look at this in aggregate terms. Um, for a family of four, the federal poverty level uh, was $24,300. The cost of living for a family of four, this was um, a family with two adults and two children receiving childcare. Um, we determine, I'll show you how we determine that, but we saw the, minim the bare minimum cost of living there as about $48,000. So essentially double the federal poverty level. And then if we go to then to Manhattan, right, the bar on the right, we see the whole other, you know, federal poverty level income um, to get to what it costs to, for a family of four to live in Manhattan, um, just, just scraping by. Um, and that's reflected in a little bit more detail on the right. We look at relative costs um, of housing and childcare, again, between Randolph County um, Indiana and uh, and uh, New York County and, and Manhattan, and again, housing in Randolph County for a two two bedroom apartment or two bedroom house is about six hundred and fifty dollars, and it's nearly triple that in Manhattan. Um, and the same was true with uh, childcare as well. Um, so the federal poverty level um, really really is problematic. Um, the fe the the government has done some other things to try to. Um, in, include some other costs, things like the supplemental poverty measure. But when, when we dug into that, we saw that it really doesn't change the ball game um, much at all. Um, right? I think the number of how the percent of households that are kind of below the supplemental poverty measure is only about fourteen percent compared to thirteen percent for the official poverty me measure. So we're not doing a much better job, um, even through the supplemental measure, um, of capturing full economic insecurity. Okay, so. Let's look at the state of Pennsylvania for a second to think about how much does it actually cost to live. Um, and these costs, and I'll explain, to, um, let's, let's do this slide first, come from kind of real world, so real world sources as best we can do. So housing comes from HUD's fair market rent, um, childcare, we're going to state childcare agencies, food we're using USDA um, information. And generally we're getting county level information um, to create um, the, these budgets so we can get as granular as we possibly can to best approximate how much it costs um, a single adult um, or a household just about any uh, conf configuration to live. And take a look in the, on the column on the far right for a second, we can see the cost for each of these line items that you can see all the way on the, on the left. Um, housing, childcare, um, food, transportation, healthcare, technology, which is a, um, a very basic uh, smartphone, just because to live and work in the modern economy now requires um, a smartphone, especially if you're working a job that you could be called in at a moment's notice, or if you're part of the gig economy um, and you're driving for Uber or Lyft or something like that. There's nothing they can do on my end. Um, I'll probably give you the wrong account, the wrong account number. Uh, sorry, Jonathan, I think that you are, there we go. Um, 
Okay. And we can see that for a family of four, two adults, one infant and one preschooler, that costs about $59,000 um, compared to the federal poverty level of, 25, of, of nearly $25,000. So again, having, and this is an average across the state, we break this down for every county so we can understand at a pretty local level just how much it costs to uh, live in and, and, so, and support a family at even the most, the most basic, even, in even the most basic conditions. All right, um, and I'll, gl I'll gloss through these quickly. I think this will be available um, via the slides and via the recording. Um, but we, we, too, too often uh, there are narratives about kind of particular groups um, based on age, race, ethnicity, household composition, kind of making up um, the bulk of the low income uh, population. And while there are kind of certainly groups that are, that are more at risk, um, a lot of what we see is that this is something that affects um, every single household. Uh, well, not every single household, but household of every single type. Um, and it is a universal problem that we need to address uh, systematically. Um, all right. And with that, uh, let's break into kind of the direct connection with the uh, maintainer's work. Um, and Stephanie, I will pass that along to you. So I think you need to share your screen now. I can also just, do you want to just advance the slides for you? Um, I think it's working. Is it, um, can you see my screen? Nope. All right. Um, seem to be, sh okay, ah, uh, wait, hold on. I think I see it. There we go. Yay. Okay, technology. <laughs> and is it great? So, uh, kind of shifting gears into uh, talking about Alice jobs in particular, and then the connection with maintenance jobs. Uh, we started by matching up the budget that Jan Dan talked to you about, and how does that match or not match with uh, wages in a certain area. Um, and in most states that we studied, uh, the majority of jobs pay less than $20 an hour. In the case of Pennsylvania, um, it's almost 60%. And that tells you that there's a lot of jobs that don't support that basic household survival budget. Um, and part of the Alice story is, you know, what are those jobs? These are jobs that we need to keep our economy running smoothly um, and that we all rely on. So here are the top 20 jobs in Pennsylvania. Number one is a retail salesperson and earning less than $11 an hour. Um, and in the top 20, you see a lot of Alice jobs, office clerks, food prep, cashiers, laborers, care aides, health, home health aides. So people that we run into on a regular basis every day. Um, so it's not some group of people way over there. It's people that um, are in our families, in our neighborhoods, and certainly um, on our way to work every day. So this made us realize all the um, work that the maintainers are doing, we know these people really well. Um, so as we like to do with a, a lot of our work, let's try and quantify um, maintainer jobs. So what we did is um, broke uh, using the Bureau of Labor Statistics, broke down all the um, occupations that are listed um, into two big groups, uh, the innovators and uh, innovation and maintenance, and then within those have two subsets. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we would love some feedback on, if this makes sense to you. 
Um, are there other categories that you would use? Um, but within innovation, we have inventors, people who are making brand new uh, things or systems or ways of doing things, and then adapters who are taking existing things but repurposing them for new things. So those are the innovation group. And then in the maintenance group, we have the nurturers who are caring for and educating our workforce, so healthcare and education. And then the infrastructure, which is focused on building and maintaining our infrastructure. Um, so we had that one main question, okay, how many jobs fit in these different categories? And then how likely are these jobs to be automated? And we rely on uh, the work of Osborne and Fry, the two um, economists uh, from Oxford uh, who have done uh, a lot of work on how susceptible jobs are to computerization. So being replaced by a computer or technology, um, and then we've been able to apply their um, estimations, which are percentages. My slideshow really wants to um, move along. So uh, we've yeah, categorized we, whether they are more than Stephanie, percent likely to be automated. Yes. Hey Stephanie, this is Andy. I think um, what I'm seeing, I don't know if everyone else is seeing, is it stuck on slide 13, overview of the labor force? Are others seeing the same? Oh. Yes, I'm seeing the same um, thing. I think, I think it's, showing, it's, it's showing, yeah, it's not showing the slideshow. It's slow, it's showing your. One slide, hmm. Hey Dan, if you have them, if you have the same slides queued up, maybe you could um, run it. Yeah, maybe I should switch back. All right, so you, you stop sharing and then I will, then I'll share. Okay. Um, yeah, there you go. I see. I'm seeing it now. Yeah, you're good. I can see it now. You can see slide 17. Mapping jobs. Yes. Yeah. Can anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's just a a pause in the internet connection. Um, all right, so actually this is the most important visual to see. So the other was more words, uh, which you already heard. Um, so we have, here's a visual of, okay, we have the inventor, adapters, nurturers, and infrastructure. Um, and you can see that most jobs uh, as, as categorized in the uh, BLS are infrastructure jobs, uh, followed by nurture, adapters and inventors, little tiny group at the very top. Um, and this is, example is from New Jersey. Um, and so we decided to display it as a pyramid. Um, and I think uh, in a way, our, our rationale for that, and hopefully it makes sense to you, is that to, to build an economy and a, a community, you need the, the base physical infrastructure, you need the people, and only when you have those things in place can you then adapt and invent further, um, which then may circle back and change what people at the infrastructure and nurture level do. Um, but you, you can't have that. Um, and so when we see the way our, certainly the, the state of New Jersey is structured, there's a very big base at the bottom, um, followed by you know, smaller and smaller groups as you go up. So um, in terms of the coloring, um, we broke these jobs down by whether they can support the survival budget. So the blue, the jobs in blue are jobs that can support uh, the single um, household survival budget, which in New Jersey is $13.33 an hour. So, um, oh wait, wait, wait. Uh, the blue are jobs that can't support 1333. So they don't support anybody. Uh, blue jobs are less than 1333. The yellow jobs pay more than 1333, but less than what it costs to support a family, which is 3737 um, an hour. Uh, so big chunk of yellow jobs that can support some families, but not all families. And then the red jobs are the ones that can support um, any the, the family 
uh, as well. So again, a very small group uh, in, in New Jersey. And then it, within those coloring, the shading, uh, the, the darker, uh, like the darker blue jobs, can um, don't support anybody, but are likely um, not likely to be uh, replaced by technology. The lighter shade blue are more than 50% likely to be replaced by technology in the next 10 to 15 years. And then similarly, the dark yellow um, are at low risk of automation. The light yellow is at a higher uh, risk of automation. And interestingly, uh, in the red jobs, um, there are uh, no, a small number to none that are um, at uh, risk of, of being uh, replaced by technology. So let's look in uh, a little, uh, dig in a little deeper um, to these and then would love some feedback and questions uh, from the group. Uh, so this is looking at the infrastructure jobs. Remember that's the group that's the, the, the biggest at the bottom of the pyramid. And um, these are some of the, the top jobs uh, in that category. So a lot of what we saw on that um, first list of jobs is the retail sales, cashiers, laborers, uh, office clerks. Um, so I think you can get the, the gist of what kind of jobs fit under infrastructure. Then when you look at nurture, uh, again, it's people who uh, feed the workforce, educate the workforce, um, provide health care for, for the workforce, um, and that's the, the nurture group, which is the, um, the, the second biggest group uh, of our typology. Uh, adapters, uh, one of the smaller groups towards the top of the pyramid. Um, is much more, um, you can see uh, more higher paid jobs and things that much more uh, involved with computers, research, um, uh, science, uh, that kind of area. And then our last group of inventors, very small group, um, but also much higher uh, wages as we see where they are on the um, pyramid. Um, and then again, uh, very focused in, in the engineering, science um, area. So we um, thought, okay, let's think about what are the implications for the automation, that when we see where these automation is, is most likely to happen, um, you know, looking at the little pyramid, huge chunks of low wage jobs, huge chunks of the middle wage jobs, are likely to be um, replaced by technology. So let's, uh, you know, what, what are those kinds of implications and how might that happen? So when you think of the economics of automation, it has to be the, the, the cost of shifting and investing in that capital has got to pay, be able to pay off. So interestingly, for a lot of the low wage jobs, it might not be economic, to make that investment um, unless they're having to pay higher wages and or they're having trouble filling those jobs. Um, for the medium wage job, this, you know, where they're having to pay more, it actually might be more economic to make that investment for, for that to happen. Um, and then it leads to the obvious next question is, you know, what happens to the people in those jobs? So are they going to be left with no jobs? Um, or will that um, investment in technology lead to a new job for them? Um, a lot of the work that we see in this area um, seems to coalesce around the idea that jobs are changing, so that jobs that never used to use technology before, suddenly you need to be able to use technology, and we certainly see that with a lot of Alice workers, um, which is part of the reason that we added in the cell phone uh, two years ago, that suddenly, you know, a home health aide who you don't think needs any technology needs to be able to get their schedule on their cell phone, report to work on their cell phone, uh, download information about their client, their patient from their phone or their tablet. Um, so even very traditional jobs that you don't think need technology 
we already see that happening, but how far can that go? Um, and then, you know, a huge question from, from our perspective is who invests in these new skills for Alice? Um, because you saw that basic budget, there's no education line item there. Um, so, so how does Alice get from where they are now to, to those next set, sets of jobs? Um, so I'm asking you a lot of questions. Uh, so hopefully we'll tee up some good discussion. Um, and, you know, other, other things that we, you know, love to hear from you are about, um, you know, is this methodology make sense to you? Where um, kind of applications do you see would be um, useful? Who else might be interested um, from, you know, community stakeholders, academics, funders? Um, and then we'll take all that feedback and put it in the pot and hopefully you'll hear more um, at the uh, maintainer conference in October. So, um, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie, if you can um, stop your screen sharing, uh, that would be great. So okay. uh, I've got a few questions prepared and I wanna make sure to leave plenty of time um, for comments and questions from um, the audience. Um, you know, so, so, and I'll skip over a couple that, um, that Stephanie, uh, you and Dan and I had discussed um, it, such as why measurement is important in, in the mix between um, quantification and, and narratives or storytelling. I would just direct people to the Alice reports um, because it has really a, um, a model mix of those things. Um, I wanna go to a question about what kinds of data that we're missing because it's pretty clear that you've done a lot to um, triangulate the different uh, sources of data. Um, and maybe you can reflect on, on some of the challenges that come from that. But I wonder if um, there are other kinds of data that we're missing that would help us make better laws or investments uh, or programs that would acknowledge and support the critical nature of um, Alice's work and of maintenance work more generally. And that's for Dan and Stephanie to, to reflect on. If, if you could have more data, um, where would it come from? What would it look like? Uh, so we're we're all about the data, uh, and and we would always uh, want more. But we are are spending a lot of our time right now trying to fill in some gaps uh, from our official uh, statistics that are available. We hear a lot of people saying, "Gosh, we have an uh, economy that's booming, low unemployment, productivity increases, everybody's doing great," and yet we sh are able to show that 42% of the population. Is struggling so that that good economic news is not reaching everybody. So we definitely need better measures that can tell us that um, that that shouldn't be a surprise. That shouldn't be a gap. That's you know like having glasses with a patch over you know one of them. <laughs> so um, we're working actually on a, a new indicator for for us in addition to our survival budget and our Alice. Um, uh, measures, but a um, kind of an Alice inflation index that shows that the basket of goods that, that Alice can afford and, and is essential for Alice to, to work in the economy is actually increasing much faster than that big broader basket from the consumer price index, um, which has a lot of items that Alice can't afford, um, but a lot of those refrigerators and video games and vacations and things that, that don't fit in Alice's budget those costs have actually stayed fairly flat, whereas things like housing and healthcare have increased significantly. Uh, Dan, what else would you add? Well, so I, I would speak kind of actually to something more, more generally and something that's even important, that, that's especially important about kind of convenings like this, um, is that it is physically impossible for us to kind of collect every piece of data um, either through kind of government, kind of kind of freely accessible sources, um, right? Things like the ACS and other surveys from BLS and the Census Bureau, um, but also um, for us to collect on our own, right? So we rely to get childcare data. We often rely on state surveys of, of um, from the child welfare agencies or education agencies, depending on the state, um, to to collect those. 
um, and then we are kind of digging into each state and hope and hoping that they can find it at the at the county level. Um, but it's important about the, the point I'm making here is about the importance of collaboration that we can't get every important uh, piece of data ourselves, um, and so kind of connect, connecting with people that collect data or people that um, um, have access to data or or know where these things are is is so important. And I think even beyond this project is so important, um, kind of to to creating a better sense of how all of these uh, pieces uh, fit, fit together. We're talking a lot about big data in the kind of in the administrative data world, right? With who's using this service and who's using that service and combining them and seeing where the overlap is. Um, but it's important that we think about that in, in the context of um, social determinants of, of health that are collected at a survey level um, and other things related to expenses and quality of, of life and, and um, wages and things like that. that are also collected at the survey level that we're combining those things to look across the country or in any given county, um, kind of what, what is the big picture and where are our blind spots. Uh, one more question from me before we throw it open um, for Q&A, and that's to, to shift the scale and the focus a little bit. Um, and I wanna think about uh, organizational finances and the world of asset management um, and I think there are some interesting parallels that we could tease out either here or with um, uh, in in the Q and A. So, um, and it's on the on the theme of data. So, different kinds of organizations, such as companies or government agencies or nonprofits or even families, um, collect data about maintenance in their own facilities and their own infrastructure. Um, so, I'm curious if you've observed um, aspects of your work with Alice. Um, and connections between the data you're collecting or connections between the problems you're trying to address on the one hand and on the other hand the ways that um, professionals in different fields um, make decisions about how they're spending on things like deferred maintenance or um, or other aspects like that and, and Stephanie I remember you you had some experience um, from one of the boards you served on I think um, that makes that connection Right. So um, w you can take this from the very micro level of um, uh, an Alice family with no extra uh, cash each month is deferring a lot of maintenance and the risk, uh, the health risks and the additional costs that that pushes down the road um, are, are, are very challenging for, for an Alice family. Um, but you can, as, as um, Andy mentioned, that we have uh, corporations, governments, um, nonprofits who are responsible for huge amounts of infrastructure and what happens when you defer that maintenance. Um, it also impacts Alice uh, families who have difficulty um, getting their electricity during a, a storm or uh, traveling miles long uh, distances to get to work if the roads aren't, aren't uh, working well. So there's a depressing side of that, but there's also um, some great work that's been done and, and, and very capable consultants and, and organizations that are actually measuring and assessing uh, maintenance uh, requirements and costs so that organizations can plan over time. So as Andy mentioned, I'm, I'm on the board of a um, large museum that has a huge building uh, and requires a, a lot of upkeep and maintenance and it's it's a huge part of the budget uh, every year and, and certainly the capital budget. So to have that quantified and laid out over 10, 15 year period um, makes it much more possible to, to plan and, and uh, attend it uh, appropriately. Great, thanks. Um, okay, I think uh, we, you know, we're collecting questions for the Q&A, so if you've got um, questions, please pop them into the chat. I see one from uh, Lee, and Lee, do you want to um, go ahead, since you're right here, do you want to go ahead and um, pose your question in your own voice? Yeah, which, which one? Um, oh, I, how many questions? Okay. Um, uh, I guess the first one is about, credit and debt 
so I'm wondering what role that like credit card debt and school loans and car payments and other kinds of debts, uh, how they affect Alice budgets and Alice households. Dan, you wanna take that one? Sure. Uh, so uh, some of those are included in there. Stephanie, correct me if, if, if I'm wrong. So we don't, we don't include um, things like necessarily credit, credit card debt um, or, or student loan debt. Right? Student loan debt is the one that kind of comes up over and over and over again. Um, and th there are reasons to think about it, but it's not something that we include um, because it is not kind of a required element to get through the month, right? Everything that's in that list is, right, housing or childcare, something that you need to pay for to make it um, kind of through, um, right? You can defer, uh, right? Some people don't have student loan debt. You can defer student loan debt. Um, and part of what we're doing here, and this is something that I, I should have said, I don't think that I did, is that we are trying to capture the bare minimum that it takes to, to live in and work in the modern economy. Um, and so we, don't include um, student loan debt, um, but we we do include. Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we do include um, kind of car payments. Um, so we don't include the, the capital cost of buying a car, but we do, we do include costs on a car. Uh, so we include that in the stability budget, which right. is meant to be kind of a contrast to. Uh, the survival budget and the survival budget somehow assumes that Alice got a car and is just keeping it ticking over. Um, and that makes Alice's life a little more precarious. Uh, where we really see the impact on Alice is that um, without that access to credit, you are very limited in an emergency um, and then certainly limited in investing in your future. Um, and, and in, we measure this across the country of uh, the uh, kind of a housing affordability gap. And really in, in increasingly more places, it's actually cheaper to own a house with a standard 30 year mortgage than it is to rent. And yet a lot of Alice households can't get there because they don't have a d money for a down payment and they can't qualify for that standard 30 more year mortgage at a reasonable rate they're charged a much higher rate, which then you know, changes the economics. So um, as, as one of my favorite new quotes, it's expensive to be poor. Yeah, my other question was related and it just has to do, you actually touched on it earlier, it just has to do with how maintenance costs affect uh, Alice households, including like cars breaking down and cell phone screens breaking and needing repaired. And I think you've already kind of touched on that, but if you guys have other thoughts, I'd love to hear them. No, um, I mean, I, I think we, we did, you're right, we touched on it a little bit, but I, I think something that's worth emphasizing is how quickly an Alice household can go into the poverty. Um, that if you, right, if you are sh struggling with a kind of an old car, which you're no longer making payments and, and you're just getting it, getting by day to day, at some point that car is going to break. And if you're an Alice household, you probably don't have um, the savings to fix that car, or you might not have it right away, or um, to get a, a replacement quickly. And so you could lose your job and, right, and, and, and that and that changes the game, and then you can't afford childcare, and it's hard to find a new job. Um, and then you kind of there's a chance uh, that you come into kind of my, my core world of, of homelessness. Um, it is. It, I think one of the things that that's so important is that we understand income um, and and assets as a, as a spectrum, and that people uh, shift back and forth, and that people that are Alice can't shift into poverty and, and vice versa. So I see a question in the chat coming from um, Doug Litwiller and he says, regarding the Alice project, is the goal helping uh, Alice reduce or manage their maintenance related expenses or is it to help them find a better paying maintenance related occupation? So if we're, uh, I hope you understand the question. Are we yep. trying to push down the costs or, or raise the raise the income or? maybe some mix of the two. 
Right. So uh, a lot of the United Ways that we work with um, actually uh, have some great programs that specifically help Alice households um, and do both of those things. Um, I think at the Alice project, uh, at the, the, the research and the data center that we're actually trying to look at a bigger picture um, and influence policymakers and uh, community stakeholders to, to, to think of the, the, the big policy solutions that, that are necessary. Um, and they are on both sides of that. Uh, so anything that brings down expenses, more affordable housing, more uh, greater access to affordable uh, quality childcare. Um, obviously there's a huge amount that could be done in, in terms of healthcare. Um, and something like public, uh, public transportation is much cheaper than the running cost of a car. And yet it's only really viable in about 50, 50 out of 3000 counties in the US. Um, so those are the things uh, at, at the broad level, at the policy level that would make a big difference. And then on, on the income side, there's things that, that government can do in terms of tax policy and um, minimum wage and some things, but there's a huge amount that companies can do uh, directly and taking care of their workers um, in, in, in many different ways. So that's, those are the, the areas that, that we're trying to impact um, from, from the Alice Project. Uh, uh, this is uh, Doug. Uh, and uh, the reason I throw that out there is uh, I've spent uh, a fair amount of time in higher ed and uh, there's, there's gonna be a significant turnover of folks that maintain the uh, highly techno technological buildings on uh, college campuses and other facilities as well. And uh, this is gonna be a great opportunity for uh, job openings for people that have the right skill sets. Uh, colleges and universities right now are having a difficult time finding people with the right skill sets for relatively high paying jobs. Uh, so I know there was a slide or two that referenced um, hourly uh, wages, uh, but I just want to throw out the relative to maintenance, uh, there's going to be a, a big need for folks that uh, ha are skilled or educated in maintaining uh, buildings. Uh, so I'm not quite sure uh, how that relates to uh, your goals with Alice, uh, but uh, that's going to be a big need that's going to be filled by somebody. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about uh, jobs gap that uh, a lot of employers are having a hard time finding people to fill certain jobs. And, you know, some of that is you know, a lag in skills. Uh, for example, you know, in the construction industry, it takes about five years um, for someone to apprentice through to be a, a qualified instruction or construction worker. Um, and during the Great Recession, they stopped those programs so that the existing workers would have work and they weren't bringing new people in. So now that they're, you know, construction's picked up again, that there's a five-year lag just for that to happen. Um, but a lot of the research has shown a lot of the problem for that gap is, is because the, the jobs aren't, aren't paying enough. Um, and so, you know, relatively well-paying job, I, I don't know what, you know, that salary is, but I do know in North Dakota, when they discovered oil and they needed, uh, you know, people to work there, and they offered jobs at $100,000, they filled the jobs, and for very highly technical things. So, um, it, it, they're, they're, you know, people find a way to get trained if it's worth their while. Um, sometimes there's a lag in that, but there, there's, uh, you. Um, I was going to, and I, I, I used to use the example, you can't get a PhD to, you know, do a minimum wage job, and then you have all these adjunct professors who probably are doing that. So, um, probably need a better example. So, I see a couple of um, policy-related questions who have come in um, uh, from Jessica. Before that, uh, just a quick follow-up from Lee about um, at Virginia Tech. Um, where where he teaches, he reports that the maintenance division can't get workers because they won't pay enough to encourage people um, to move to Blacksburg. Um, sounds a little crazy to me, but um, the, so it's not just a mismatch between skills, it's skills and geography as well. That's what I'm hearing. Um, the, to turn to policy, um, Jessica has a couple of questions. Um, first is if there's a, a basic basket of Alice um, policy recommendations, uh, whether to do with wage hikes, 
housing costs, I would probably ask um, medical care costs as well. Um, and then also, what's the handoff or collaboration um, between Alice and policymakers? So do you give testimony? Do you draft policy directly? Are you trying to influence um, or draft model legislation that might be um, rolled out at the state level? Um, so if you could um, address either of those questions, we'd, we'd be really interested. Uh, so I, I know you're hitting a mirror with Dan right now. Uh, we, we have a big uh, debate in our, in our group about the extent of specific policy recommendations that we make. Um, and uh, we would welcome some feedback, but in the, the current uh, political climate, we have chosen not to make any policy recommendations. That uh, once data is attached to a policy, if you're against the policy, you don't look at the data. And we feel very strongly that everyone needs to recognize Alice exists and this cost of living and, and jobs mismatch um, is, is a, a, a crucial issue no matter what your, your politics. Um, so we've really worked on um, trying to, to reach out to all uh, political parties uh, and have done a lot of uh, state and federal uh, uh, presentations and meetings and uh, you know ed education efforts, um, which is where we are now. Um, however, we can't help ourselves by, um, so no specific policy recommendations, but it's very clear that there are general areas that would make a huge difference. And Dan, you wanna add into that? Uh, I'll, I'll, try to add, I'll try to add a little bit without getting myself into, into trouble. Um, there is United Way line after all. Um, but I, <laughs> think that it is important. So, right, there, there, there is value in making sure that we get everyone on the same page and understand at least the universe in which we're living. Um, right, I, I, and that is something that I think maybe we've taken for granted in, in the past and now we, we look at and we go, can we just recognize these basic facts? And there is some value there and maybe in this political climate even more now than there was uh, a few years ago. So that is in itself an incredibly valuable and 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 hard effort and one that the United uh, Way and its partners right, uh, do, do a lot to do. Um, but also in addition to kind of our small group, a lot of our work is taken by the local United Ways and then they are, in addition to us, they are meeting with their state legislators um, or policymakers at a local or state level or even at a national level to talk about some of these, to some of these issues. Um, so we, we wanna make sure that those conversations exist. So even if we are not explicitly prescribing uh, uh, policy proposals, um, we are making sure that, that it gets out there. And one of the things where we kind of had a little, had a little bit of, of pride, put a little feather in our cap during the 2018 midterms um, was that there were questions that directly um, came out of Alice reports um, in three gubernatorial debates. Uh, they didn't always explicitly mention Alice, but they, they were, the questions, certainly the stats in there, were very distinctly linked um, to the, the data that we had put out. Um, and many of the candidates to whom those questions were, were asked could speak to um, some of the details in, in those reports. Um, and so while we're not explicitly kind of pushing uh, policy, um, we are making sure that the information that we are putting out there is getting into the, the hands of people that can kind of really run with it, not just at the, the nonprofit level, but at the policy level as well. So it sounds like anyone um, on this call or your advocates or allies, um, they could advance the cause by getting those reports into the hands of their um, local and state officials and, and demanding that they pay attention, regardless of what party they're in. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe those who are running for office as well. It sounds like a, a good vector um, for, for um, action. So That'd be I th great. I think we have uh, time for one more question, which um, comes from uh, Sam, who asks, uh, who says, um, I'd be curious to see what trends emerge um, if disaggregated for people with criminal records. Um, so, for example, are skilled people with a felony history being excluded from jobs that offer a living wage? So, that's, so we do. Uh, uh, go for it. Go ahead. No, Stephanie, answer. Go for it. 
we, we are looking uh, more closely at the adult population because one of the uh, interesting corollaries to the very low unemployment rate rate right now is that there's a very high uh, number of people of adults outside of uh, the labor force, um, the, the highest ever in some places and, and near record in others. So um, unfortunately, uh, a, a portion of those are people with a felony record that have a hard time getting hired. Um, and, and there are a number of groups that do work with us and, and advocate things like ban the box, um, and as the labor market is, is getting tighter, um, as, as your question uh, points out, that there are uh, people who have skills um, and may have learned skills uh, while, while they are in prison and, and now you know, could be doing a good job. And uh, it seems silly to, to exclude them from the labor market. Great, thank you. Um, I see we're just about at the top of the hour, so um, unfortunately we've got to wrap up. It feels like things are things are just getting started here. Um, Dan, Stephanie, any uh, you want to get in the last word? Uh, no, thank you all so much, and I hope that you, if you uh, have any suggestions for us or feedback on our maintainer pyramid, um, we we would love to hear from you. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll say again in, in kind of a, this, this this spirit and vein of collaboration that this is incredibly important for us to kind of see the connections with, with the maintainers work and and um try to try, try to build a, a broader base not just of, of support and interest in this project but but of data because it's going to make it it's going to make our work and hopefully um the work that each of you are are doing kind of far far better and more informed to have these these perspectives and as stephanie just alluded to um and we've mentioned a couple of times right this is all a work in progress right one of the benefits of continually putting out reports and um updating your data is that we is that this is a, a breathing living um tool and if there are better data sources and um, ways to expand our understanding of um, these occupations and, and the, the, these problems more generally, um, we, we want to hear from you. So we hope that this is the, the start of a conversation. Thank you so much. So um, two plugs before we go, ways to continue the discussion. Um, first, we've got uh, uh, our next virtual roundtable on September 27th about the future of work, um, very much taking off of this discussion. Um, Lee Vinsel and Patrick McRae will be our hosts and Diane Bailey and Yulia Frumer will be our panelists. Uh, there's more information on the maintainers in the workforce community at um, themaintainers.org slash communities. And you can find some instructions there about the group and uh, or, or information about the group and instructions for how you can contribute. Uh, second, Stephanie will be with us at our big conference in Washington, um, October 6th through 9th, Maintainers 3. That has four tracks of programming, including several sessions that touch on some of the themes we've discussed today. Stephanie's panel is on Monday, October 7th. It's called Labor Maintainers at Work, and it features advocates, organizers, and scholars um, who all think about labor and maintenance from a variety of perspectives. Thanks again for joining us. Let's thank our maintainer um, and facilitator, Jessica Meyerson, for doing a great job as usual in the background. And, um, it's been great to be here with you all today, and thanks so much to Andy, Dan, and Stephanie. This was a great conversation, and to all of our attendees for your excellent questions. We're going to capture both the chat, or I should say the chat, and all of your questions are captured as part of the recording. And as soon as we have a transcript for the recording, we'll post it online and share it more broadly. Thank you, Jess. Great, thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.